If you'd like to try what we make at Superstition, it's as easy as going to our website, superstitionmeadery.com, clicking on Web Store, and you're shopping. Make sure you follow us on social media because we release new products almost every week, and you might just find your next favorite craft beverage. Cheers. Oh, thank you. Awesome. What do we have here, Chef? Pineapple upside down cake. Um, it is topped with our tropical beast mead production. Um, we've got some Perfect. toasted coconut uh, and just some whipped cream. Looks amazing. Thank you so Thank much. You. Awesome. So, so this, this is, is a dish, huh? Yeah, and this is, you know, a very nice fancy, dusted, plated version of what we're gonna right. do. Cause you know, when you're with, you have 600 people at once, we're gonna have some cool, like, you know, serving size cups right. going out. But this is something that, this is how we would present this in our restaurant. Because as you know, Superstition, if it's about anything, it's all things quality all the time. So Definitely. I'm super excited to try this. And then I'm, I'm really happy that you were here to join me today to try yeah. all of these different beverages to kind of see, well, if we do incorporate this as a, a chef special or yeah. something that's on our menu, what would we recommend pairing it with? So, yeah. Well, the tropical beast obviously is a logical choice, but uh, I think you're right. So we got peacher creature, tropical beast, and then we get into super bee, a traditional mead. We've got LDO, one of my favorites. Yeah. We've got Tahitian honey. We'll see how vanilla goes, and then yeah. something like nefervescent at the end with Astral Reef, our yeah. our sizer, with uh, the the wine grapes that we rehydrated to make this paquette sizer. Yep. So. I think the first thing we should do is try this thing. Okay, let's do it. Mm. That's ridiculous. Mm. Wow. I haven't even gotten into the coconut. Mm. I like that pineapple too. It's, it's got a nice good layer of that. And it's roasty. They hit this with a torch. Oh yeah. To get that Maillard reaction. Oh, on the top of the. Wow. The coconut, dude. Mm. All right. So, funny thing, no one knows this, but. Oh, I like that. One of the meads we're working on, our ten-year anniversary is in May. We did this collab with Rally Farmhouse, and going back a couple years ago, way before the world got all crazy and all, yeah. I was in Vail, and. Jen and I were hanging out at this restaurant and they had a really cool looking cocktail menu and they had an orange pina colada. And for me, the definition of vacation is like that first pina colada. Oh yeah. And this was, a, we were in the mountains, right? So it wasn't like you're on the beach, but it was an orange pina colada. Mm -hmm. It was boozy and, and, and just so full of flavor. And I said, mm -hmm. one day I'm gonna make a mead like this. So right now yeah. we have an orange pina colada mead in a rum barrel, mm -hmm. should be out in a couple of months. That would be amazing with this. It would. I've tried it about two months ago out of the barrel. Yeah. But we actually use Tropical Beast, right. one of our products in here. So let's give that a shot. Let's do it. Thank you. Wow, what a nose. Citrus, mm -hmm. tropical, pineapple. Definitely, it all comes through in the nose. And you can see this reduction over here made with this mead. I mean, we do mead and food pairing, and that's a ton of fun, but when you actually cook with mead, when you make a reduction, when you make a salad dressing, when you make a marinade, when you make a barbecue sauce, people don't think about it in those terms so often. No, and also, correct. mead's expensive, and it helps to happen to have some bottles of meat sitting around the house. But, all right, all right let's see how this goes. All right. What do you think? I like that pairing. It works real good. Yeah. Picks up the coconut, kind of comes through. I think some of the tropical flavor mm -hmm. is complimentary, but I think that the the pleasant astringency mm -hmm. is is a contrast to, to this sweet, doughy, mm -hmm. cakey thing going on yeah. with this dessert. And that helps you forget about the dessert, yeah. pull a few notes out of it, and then I want right. to go back for another bite. Feature creature. This has turned into be a much more versatile pairing mead than I'd ever expect it. Yeah, because it's a little bit lighter in alcohol, feature creature. And um, it's, um, you know, it's got the, the grapefruit notes. It's just kind of lifts it a little bit in terms of acidity. 
but you get that peach right in the front of the palate with peach or creature. And uh, you can even get the, the sea salt and the hops all come together. Kind of the mid palate to finish, you get that sea salt notes, but it, like a lot of our meads, um, very like subtle. We don't typically overpower with ingredients. It's you know? balanced. Yeah, it's balanced. And I, I think if you were to define our style, it's going to be detectable but balanced booze and flavors mm -hmm. that are layered where you can you can pick them out, yeah. but they go together and they complement themselves. Yeah. You know, and I'm interested to see what Super B, what a sweet traditional mead would would do with this because there's going to be some some different flavor compounds we get out of here, right? But it's not going to be like an overt fruitness. Let me try this uh, feature creature. Super B is evolving, man. Mm. Okay. Ooh. Mm. Try, try Super B with just like, with, yeah, with just like this, the coconut. Get some of this toasted oh, okay. coconut. Yep. I don't dislike Peacher Creature though with it either. I like it a lot. I think the, mm. the Tropical Beast pops, but I think, think about, right, so there's a lot going on. Like we haven't yeah. even tried Raspberry yet, yeah. but, but this, this Super Bee, the essence of Arizona wildflower honey, right? Yeah. With that coconut is really mm. cool. Yeah, you almost get like, a, almost like a toasted quality with this Super Bee. It really goes well with that with that toasted coconut for sure. Wow, and that's a traditional sweet. And you know when we we did our Berry White Day dinner this year, we had a dessert. We had we had different desserts, six desserts arranged in a constellation, yeah. and we had we had something that was kind of this doughy component that would be a palate cleanser in between all of the different desserts mm -hmm. for six different meads and. It's, this is so complex that it might make sense for us to offer a pairing dessert flight, mm -hmm. but if we can choose one of these things that just kind of goes with it all, mm. that would be interesting. But I'm also excited to try LDO because this is just Super like- Super goes good. really good with the with the cake part. Uh, oh, I let think. me try that. All yeah. right. All right, so I'm gonna get in here. I think it's a really good pairing with the, with the cake of this dish. So, I think it's complimentary with mm -hmm. the cake and the coconut, yeah. but you know what? Let's try it with like a raspberry and a little bit sure. of, of pineapple and this, this reduction that was made from Tropical Beast. Yeah. See, that goes with the raspberry, but it doesn't make it better. It doesn't make a raspberry better and the raspberry doesn't make that better. And I think that's something I look for in pairings is mm -hmm. when the drink and the food, oh, yeah. they, they each make each other better. I think the acidity in that raspberry is kind of a conflict. Yeah. Perhaps, you know. All right, so what about LDO? So now we've got, we're gonna have some bourbon. Which one's LDO, this one right here? Is that the third oh, one? Oh yeah. So, mm. it's it doesn't drink as dry as it really is. People will be, you know, I think surprised if they know about fermentation to know that yeah. how dry this thing really is, but the vanilla that we pulled out of the barrel and the aromatics of the honey mm -hmm. that are that are flowing out of this glass, that's really unique. But that is different, but sometimes a spirit will mm -hmm. go with a dessert really nice. Well, and even though that's like one of our least sweet meads probably, it goes pretty good. The, uh, the bourbon barrel notes really kind of pair nicely with that. And you know, it is definitely contrasting, but Mm -hmm. The bourbon, the booziness, and the vanilla, and the wood coming yeah. out of this. Yeah. It actually goes with that raspberry bite I just had. Mm. That's quite surprising. And again, not the same. Like the super bee and the coconut, the super bee and the cake. Super complimentary and fun. But that changes the way a raspberry tastes. Mm. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's another way to describe mm. food pairing. Is yeah. Are you changing the way the drink taste or the food taste by having them together. Right. And as long as it changes it in a positive way right. or a surprising way, it's it's worth the effort. Well, and, and like sometimes like 
like spicy foods, for example, go great with mead because it's kind of a counterbalancing act, you know? You wouldn't want to serve a big, heavy Cabernet Sauvignon with a, you know, with a sweet um, or, or a spicy dish, for example, because it would be like throwing gas on a fire, you know? That's why, like, Thai food restaurants and stuff like that, they serve a lot of Gewurztraminers and uh, sweeter style Rieslings because they don't want to accentuate the heat typically in that type of cuisine, so. Yeah, and even like a, you know, a Singha, like a, like a malty Thai lager is really yeah. nice with Thai food yeah. if you're going that route. Yeah, you're right. All right, dude, so you selected Tahitian Honeymoon and yep. this is the most vanilla forward right thing yeah. we've ever done. Let's see how that goes. We, you know, in, in, the, in the world of using honey, I mean, we're relying on insects to provide us with the thing that defines who we are. Yeah. And we're relying on agricultural products, often from around the world. In this case, quite literally, from Tahiti. Right. These are the $500 a pound, crazy, fat, juicy Tahitian vanilla beans that the so best you can and get. And they're so unique, you know, in terms of vanilla beans themselves, where if you have Madagascar or Mexican vanilla beans, they're they're more of your, you know, your typical vanilla extract flavor, you know, where where Tahitian vanilla beans have a much like softer, more floral quality about them. Um, that's why we make a specific mead just around right, the Tahitian Right, and you get that in the beans. nose. What you yeah. just described, this soft floral characteristic. Yeah. You can smell it, you can taste it, it coats your palate, it goes with the bread, it goes with the coconut. Dude, I don't know, a Tahitian might be that. Mm. Wow. All right, let's, let's- That might be my favorite. Let's, let's do like- Cause it goes so well with the cake. It's perfect with the cake. Mm. Kind of like Super B, but let's see if vanilla can stand up to raspberry and coconut mm, together. That's true. Let's give that a whirl. The coconut, by the way, tames the raspberry. I've never had that combination together. All right, I'm setting that aside because I think that's my favorite. Now, let's try something totally different. We're gonna have some Mine apples, too. we're gonna have some wine grapes, some honey. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have some carbonation. Yep. This is gonna be light. I imagine it's gonna cut through the richness of this dessert. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's what you want in a pairing. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you can be surprised, but that's why you do taste things like this so that you find the perfect pairing, you know. And for our customers here, that's what we're all about, is food and mead pairings. That is just, is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I want to like it. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm almost there, but I think Tahitian. Yeah, out of these six, definitely Tahitian. Wow. I had 100% agree. All right, I, dude, well, cheers. Yeah. We figured it out. We sure did, thank you. So is this gonna be a new dessert that we're gonna have on the menu, or? Well, we don't know. We're gonna, we're gonna see how it's received on Sunday. Okay, yeah. At one of the coolest food and drink festivals that happens in, yeah. in Arizona called Dish Fest. So. And that's in Scottsdale, by the way. Yeah. We'll see, um, we'll see what people think. Mm -hmm. So, Jim, you've been our, you, you've worked with, with, with us. I mean, it was, it was Jen and I. Yeah. The kids, like, helping out a little bit when they were really yeah. young. And then we started working together because you had, and, and jump in if I, if I have this wrong at all, but you had started a company because you saw that there was an opportunity to represent Arizona wineries that yeah. were small enough to self-distribute, but not big enough to really go with a distributor. Right. And in the wine world, typically you're going to you're going to make wine in, in September, right? You're going to get, pick the grapes, crush the grapes, and it depends on where you are. And you got one shot at it. Yeah, you get one <laughs> shot. You're going to make wine, and hopefully by, say, August of the next year, you're selling that wine. It's bottled. I mean, sometimes right. you're going to leave things in barrels for years or whatever, but right. for the most part, that last year's crop and beverage is something that you want to start selling because then you need to be making wine. You don't have time to bottle. Right, so you yeah. got to get that stuff out of barrels, get it into yeah. bottles, and cork it, and label it, and get it out on shelves. And then, depending on how big a winery is, if they're lucky, I guess, like they're going to sell that out kind of quick. And then yeah. they're testing the wine, doing what winemakers do throughout the year. 
and you were able to do that for a, a dozen or more Arizona wineries. Yeah. But when we met at a winery, right, <laughs> where we started, we we were we were talking, and I said, hey, we don't have a cycle like that. Right. We can make mead and cider year round. Year round. Yeah. And so, over some time. Um, I think we became your biggest client. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, and, and now you've been working for us, to, you know, directly for a while as you know our original and, and, and just most kick-ass sales rep going. Oh, thank you. Um, and it, it's just it's amazing what you've done for superstition, and, and 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 that goes beyond us. I say this a lot, and I don't think I could mean it more. But we're a representation of an industry. We're not just who who superstition is, right. and. And, and that means that what you do for us and the techniques that you develop as a sales rep right. are things that, that, that ultimately, when, when you're leading the way, right. will be copied. Yeah. And also, that'll be copied because they're proven, you know? Right. And now, you've traveled around the country, and you're going to festivals, right. and you're opening up new markets for us, and, and you're yeah. introducing mead from Alaska right. to the East Coast. Who would have thought? They Texas. drink a lot of mead in Alaska, though. <laughs> yeah, all over California. Um, tell me about, maybe, you know, some of that that experience and some of the stuff you've learned. And how have you seen the mead world change in the wow. last eight or nine years of working together? I mean, it has changed a hundred percent, like exponential growth since I first started being a judge at the Mazer Cup to see how mead has the quality of mead from you know eight years ago to now like all the mead areas that were kind of just getting started us included uh you know eight ten years ago um they're now the industry leaders domestically speaking and globally you know like with us being in so many countries now um but when i first started with you i'd only had like maybe one or two meads in my entire life before um, I tasted your stuff, and um, so it was. It was an education in how to sell mead because you don't sell mead like you would sell traditional wines, and um, it's. Uh, how was that different? Well, because our our number one customer base is a craft beer drinker. Um, in traditional wine bars, most wine drinkers are going there to drink dry wines. You know your. Cabernet Sauvignons and your Chardonnays, they're not typically looking for sweeter style, you know, wines. Um, and although most of our products lean more towards the sweeter end, we do produce a whole range of different styles of mead. And I think that that's one of the advantages of mead and is that it is so versatile. You can have sparkling meads, uh, you know, you can have dry to sweet. Um, so that versatility, um, we can produce a whole range of products. You know, a couple years ago, we started with canned session meads, um, and that is a whole another category that has got our foot in the door, places that wouldn't normally or have the experience or knowledge about what mead is, um, you know, because it's a lower price point, and so oftentimes they can kind of start with our products with those canned session meads and then as they build a following with their their clientele you know they can get into some of our bottled meads at full strength and you know another thing that makes superstition unique i, I believe is our our full bodied quality of our meads you know you see a lot of meads around the country and around the world coming in at eight to ten percent where our our core products are typically you know thirteen and a half percent and We've always believed, I think, that you know, having that full-bodied quality in our meads really is a much better transporter of the flavors that are you know, in our meads. That's the best way to say that I think I've ever yeah. heard. That's fantastic, man. Yeah, it becomes a great vehicle to carry those flavors forward, having that full-bodied quality. Um, yeah, anytime we try something, um, because pe there's different people like different things, right? And so we're always going to be doing some drier stuff, some carbonated stuff, some lower ABV stuff. Yeah. And, but collectively, the reception is always less positive than when we come out with a big, bold, balanced mead, because you're right. It allows someone to experience the flavor in such a new way, because yeah. there's so many examples in the world of, of meads or beers or wines or ciders that are 
approachable and easy to drink and less expensive and kind of kind of kind of fit for everyone's palate right. but but what we're known for and what, what 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 we're passionate about is creating some of the most unique flavor combinations anyone's ever had before oh yeah and that no one's ever had before yeah and that's that's really what people like and, and unfortunately in a in a macro economic sense that limits you know the sort of customer base that we have which makes it challenging to yeah. to introduce and i always say our biggest challenge is that meat is still very largely unknown and it's it's expensive to make because yep. what's honey cost right yep. I and mean, that defines it but what are some other challenges that you've seen and and maybe some that may, maybe you see going away is in your experience well definitely i mean it, it was it was a challenge more so when we first started about customer acceptance and knowledge about mead, uh, I would say, you know, 98% of the population didn't even know what mead was when we first started. That has changed a lot though. Um, large part by us, you know, here in Arizona, being the first, you know, Arizona meadery. Um, and just, you know, all the tastings and events we've done really has built our customer base. Um, but initially, it was difficult. I didn't even really know how to sell the product, you know, when we first started 10 years ago. And, um, and like I said, it appeals to craft beer drinkers. Not to say that the wine world, the typical wine world, doesn't have acceptance with it, but it's gonna find itself on dessert menus and restaurants, um, but in tap houses and breweries, which we do a lot of collaborations with, we've been able to build that following for our product. And, uh, but continued education, not only for our distributor partners um, around the country and around the world, but um, to consumers themselves through tastings, um, is super important for our industry um, to gain more acceptance. And, you know, we've talked about, you know, competition coming in, and we don't, we don't mind competition. As a matter of fact, we, we appreciate people starting meteries because we know it's expensive um, and it's, it's not an easy road to hoe. Um, but um, I think the more and more meteries that are out there and the more availability uh, of mead throughout the country is going to build an even bigger following for everybody. You know, in the last week I had the opportunity to do probably more travel than I have in recent years for a lot of reasons. And one of those trips, I went to Miami. And I was planning an event at Three Sons. We did a collab and stuff. And they sold tickets to a, a mead and cheese pairing event. And we, we selected some cheeses. And it was what I introduced to everyone as, hey, guys, this is a blind pairing event. Meaning yeah. I'm from Arizona, Corey's from Miami. And we each talked about these flavors. Yeah. But we haven't actually tried them together. So we're going to experience this together yeah. in this event. And there were... I think maybe 30 different people, maybe they sold more than that. But anyways, there was at least 30 people at this event. We took turns talking about what we were doing. And the thing that still gets me really excited is when someone has never had mead before and the look on their face is confused and surprised and shocked and delighted yeah. all at the same time because they're like, I've never had anything like this, Yeah, you know? And, and, and to this day, like, you travel around to, you know, I think about some breweries I like to go to and stuff, but like, who has 60 choices? I mean, right. look, look behind us at the yeah. shelf. That doesn't even count a reserve program. Oh, We've yeah. got 24 taps of different things, and every yeah. single thing here, like, we have made, you have sold, right. and they're so different and so unique. And then right after that trip, I got back, before I even went home, I picked up my kid to go down to his first beer festival in Mexico because it's 18 there, right? So Logan's in college. Uh -huh. We drive down to Hermosillo, and we were part of this Arizona um, sort of booth, right, where they had they had, a, they had a couple kegerators and a bunch of different Arizona breweries, and we had, you know, a keg on constantly. No one else ran through one keg. We went through three and a half in yeah. this time, and people, like, were shocked. Yeah. And people in Mexico, not far south of, of us, just a few hours south of the border, had never conceived of the flavors that we were, we yeah. were introducing and, and the mouthfeel and everything. Right. And it was so fun to, to share that with people. Yeah. And I, I love that too when I do tastings or I'm at a festival and 
Um, you know, when we're at festivals, we're one of the most popular booths. We have a line, you know, out the field <laughs> for people waiting to taste our meads that have experienced our mead before. But I would still say, you know, there's tons of people that don't know what mead is. And they certainly don't know how to pair it with food, which was so great about this location here in downtown is that people can come and experience meads, but also with just amazing food as well. Um, the presentation of all the dishes is just amazing here and the flavor profiles. Uh, and to be able to try, you know, multiple style of meads, even though we're not a, a traditional mead producer in general, but, you know, we had that, we had that 10 different uh, traditional meads that we did just recently, which highlights, you know, like, like a grape variety, like Cabernet Sauvignon or Chardonnay. That's like what the honey does. And having that project highlighted how the, um, the flavor and aroma profile of a given honey, you know, makes that, that ultimate mead and uh, the differences that the varietal honey uh, makes it. Um, with a with a final mead product, you know? yeah, that's a good point. I think a lot of people, though, they may go to the grocery store and buy honey from time to time. If right. you're not like you know an aficionado, right. and maybe you've read the label or mm -hmm. it's, it says clover honey or wallflower honey, but but yeah, if, I mean, if you don't know, like honey is crazy different. Like some honey is yeah. it smells like honeysuckle and orange blossom, and right. some honey is like dark as night. They got it out of the hive in the right. peak of the summer. They were going to pecan trees to get, and it's like, right. like just dark, dark brown yeah. and super rich, and it tastes like caramel molasses. Right. And then there's really light, beautiful honeys from sunflowers, and and all of those different nectar sources that the yeah, bees citrus, are going to. Yeah, right. They're going to create a product that's just as different as any grape varietal, any right. grain, any hop, and and it's really fun to showcase that when we have the opportunity. Right. And it is. It's challenging, right? You've got to yeah. go to local beekeepers. A lot of times these guys and gals, they're used to selling their honey in little jars for a ton of money at a right. farmer's market because they can and they should and it's worth it. Right. But we don't buy honey in little jars anymore. No, yeah. So we have to find folks where it's like, okay, minimum five gallon bucket, hopefully a drum. What do right. you guys have for us? You know? Yeah. But, but you know, you're right. We were able to work with so many cool nine different apiaries around the state mm -hmm. from several different beekeepers to yeah. create a really amazing experience. And then we did a blend of all 10. And right. so you can come in here today and get a flight of 10 traditional meads. Right. And each label has a map of where the bees were flying from around Arizona. Yeah. And you get to try really different stuff. Yeah, and then being able to take those honeys and then incorporate other ingredients that is a good fit. Just like a food and mead pairing, you know. No, you're totally right. There, yeah. there are times where we have chosen, selected a honey in order to pair with the fruit or the wood that right. we want to go into this project that we right. envision is going to work out one day when we're done. Right. And sometimes it's hard to know, you know, when you start things like that, how it's going to turn out. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't, but most of the time uh, we have enough experience at this point, you know, 10 years on that um, we have a good idea about what things go together now. Um, and with this, location to be able to pair those with specific types of foods also that we handcraft you know to go with the meads is just a great overall experience for consumers um, i love having new accounts come down here and try try the meads available and what the possibility is and like you said when people try our mead they have this look of astonishment on their faces you know and and for us because you make such high quality meads you make my job a lot easier. Well, that's good. <laughs> so lately, you've been doing something a little different. Like in the past, you'd go out on your own and you'd set up a tasting and you would try and convince a restaurant, a bar, a bottle right. shop to, to try this product out, right? Right. And, and now we're working with a big distributor, Hensley in Arizona. Right. And when you go around doing a, a ride along with someone, like how is that different now when you're working with someone that's used to selling, you know, a bunch of different beers usually right. and then and now you're like hey we've got this meat and cider stuff like how, how do you how do you work that in what's successful well you know for the most part like getting into an account really means building a relationship with the buyer um, that's probably the most important thing with uh, mead sales but uh, like I said these people are typically professionals but a lot of them haven't had experience with mead 
Um, so because of their experience and knowledge with other products like wine and beer, um, once they taste our meads, then they're as surprised sometimes as consumers would be, you know, that have no experience with it. Um, so allowing them to taste um, the meads and the ciders that we produce, that's usually always ends in a good result because of the quality of the products. Um, and being able to model sales for our sales reps with Hensley um, is invaluable to them because they haven't had a lot of experience just like I did didn't 10 years ago, you know. They don't have a lot of experience with mead and how to sell it as well because, like I said before, uh, mead can't be sold just like traditional wine is. Um, it appeals to a different group of people, those craft beer drinkers. Uh, they're much more accepting and knowledgeable about mead, uh, where your traditional wine drinkers are not. Um, it does have its place in the wine world, um, even though it seems like we don't get our dues a lot of times, you know, but... Um, I agree, and I think changing the way people drink is about changing the way people think, yeah. and that's not easy. No because they're used to having things. But you know, younger drinkers that are coming of age, they, they want something different. They don't, they don't want their daddy's Budweiser a lot of times, you know? I think people really appreciate, certainly our customers, a connection to the people that make the product, yeah. to understanding where the ingredients come from from some time, right? right? To, to understanding why it goes really well with with this food that we're working right. so hard. And I would say behind the scenes, but it's not, our kitchen is open. You right. see everything happening right there right. when you come in here. That's and, great. you know, if, if you were part of, you know, Berry White Day or joined our guild, you can take advantage of the couple times a year that we, we do uh, tours at our production facility. Right. And so, I mean, March 26th, We've got right. Guild Day coming up. Right. I hope you can join us yeah. and, you know, of course, be a guest of honor. Sure. And uh, we're going to be doing our tours of our production facility, and then we're going to have a really awesome catered event for all of our Guild members. Yeah, and we're going to introduce these six really unique meads. We've never, we've, never, we've never done these flavors before. We've never done these woods before. It's like, yeah. it's so new, which is a risk for yeah. sure, but... I happened to try a few of them recently, and, yeah. and we're, we're, we're going into a really amazing direction with some really bold flavors. And, yeah. you know, maybe not everyone's going to like every one, but right. I, I kind of like every one, and they are all so unique and mm -hmm. different, and that's really fun. Yeah, and, it's nice to create those exclusive uh, meads for the guild, and, um, but just experimenting, you know, as we've done since the very beginning, um, and perfecting, like, our core products over the years, too. Um, Tahitian Honeymoon today is like one of those examples, Lagra Masco Oro also another example of our, our basically our first mead that we produced 10 years ago and how it has evolved um, over the years. Um, you know some things like Marion Mead basically taste the way they did 10 years ago, you know. Um, but certain things like Tahitian Honeymoon have really improved. Yeah, we've changed the vanilla a little as far as the amounts yeah. and the way we introduce it. LDO, the bourbon barrels are going to be a little different all the time. Right. And we decide when to package that based on our stock supplies, mm -hmm. right? So when we see that we're getting down to like a pallet or two yeah. of LDO in our warehouse, then it's like, well, we better pull some nails and see if those barrels are ready. And we know it's yeah. going to be a minimum of three months, sometimes as much as 12 before it's time to go. Right. One of the reasons why this batch has so much vanilla is we wait it longer. We, we made like a huge batch at one yeah. point in time. It took a minute to sell through it. And then by the time we packaged this, it extracted so much vanilla out of the wood. Yeah. And when the barrel maker, the Cooper's toasting or charring right. that wood and these these barrels were former bourbon barrels, so they were charred. And the bourbon that was in there extracted the color and the flavor yeah. and the caramel sort of thing that was coming out of that like alligator char. And then over time, this got further in to where yeah. the wood wasn't charred but toasted. And that's where that lignin chemically changes to vanillin. Yeah. And we were able to pull vanilla out because it spends so much time in barrels. Yeah, but still balanced, you know, that's still the thing with Lagra Mascaro and, and, the, and the bourbon barrel aging. It's 
it's not so overpowering that, you know, all you're going to taste is that bourbon barrel, you know? Yeah, I think if you're a bourbon lover or if you like cocktails, you know, right. like an old fashioned that happen to have some bourbon in there, right. but you don't want to just drink bourbon, that's an awesome thing. Oh, definitely. Because you get the honey, you get the right. bourbon, but it, yeah, you're right. It's, it's balanced. You get those and vanilla notes coming through. Yeah, 15 ish percent, depending on the batch, versus like 40% right. plus or 60% plus for like right. barrel strength bourbon. Well, definitely bourbon lovers are going to love that mead. Um, and it is one of our drier meads as well, you know, I think off dry, that one, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, we, we make a whole range of styles from dry to sweet, even though our sweeter meads tend uh, to be our more popular meads. I think that's just because people's perception, too. Maybe they don't know what a drier mead even tastes like, but all the time in tastings and stuff, like war honey and lager masto oro tend to be some some people's favorites, you know, over the sweeter um, styles of meads. Cool. Well, Jim, thank you for trying this thank dish you. with me and, and selecting what will be a perfect pairing for Dish Fist and Heck here yeah. if we throw it on the menu. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that on Sunday. All right, man. Grab a cheers. Thank you so much. All right. We'll see you soon. You bet.